Chopard, over the years, has become the very last word in luxury timepieces and jewellery. But can they translate that into the fashion world? Before the Chopard Couture debuts on Tuesday, I wanted to take a look at the history to understand if this would be a good move for the company. Or perhaps, why not? Chopard was founded in 1860 by Louis-Olie Chopard as a small shop in Saint-Villiers, Switzerland, named Léonard Frédéric Chopard et C that only consisted of Chopard himself and a few employees. Louis-Louis Chopard was the son of a farmer named Félicien Chopard from whom he learned the trade, as at this time to make ends meet, farmers would work on watches during the winter. So, though his father never was a professional horologist and the family was from a relatively average or lower than average means, it was obvious that his son possessed a talent and so he taught his son everything he knew from a very early age. So, with obvious talent and already years of watchmaking experience, Viulis used that to his advantage, coming up with innovations in the watchmaking sector regularly, even from the opening of his own shop, with his first innovation being the manufacturing company that the whole company was founded upon in 1860. Having observed that it was much more profitable to market the finished watch than it was the mechanisms inside, which was common previously, he cut out the middleman to pretty much become the ready-to-wear of timepieces, just on an extremely small scale at first, innovating in a sector that had long been seen as stable, which gave him a major advantage over his competitors at the time, like Patek Philippe, Vacheron Constantin, and Jaeger Le Coultre. Fairly quickly, he became the watchmaker to know. Despite starting his business at only the age of 24, because of his willingness to experiment with new technologies and constantly look for ways to improve his watches, within just a few years, he already had timepieces on Tsar Nicholas II of Russia and other major elites of the day. I wouldn't say that he was yet a household name, because that would be a stretch, but he was extremely well known for that type of client. All of which helped propel the company as they were about to release their biggest hit product to date, the wristwatch. The wristwatch had actually already existed for some time at this point. In fact, there's arguments as to who in particular made the wristwatch first, whether it was Abraham Louis Bruget, who made the wristwatch for Queen Caroline Murat of Naples in 1810, whereas others believe it was Patek Philippe who made a wristwatch for the Countess Koskovitz of Hungary in 1868. But despite who in fact was the inventor, it was still an innovation for Chopin to introduce it at this level for his own company to expand on their product offering to include a women's option. Though, there are debates on exactly when it was released for Chopin as well. But regardless, the business was bigger than ever. Probably still not a household name, but for the timepiece industry, they were now a heavyweight with 150 workers in 1915. At least, that was all up until, in the same year, Louis-Élie Chapald would sadly pass away. He was succeeded in his company by his son, Paul Louis, who had a completely different approach to the company. Instead of focusing directly on the mechanics of a timepiece, they focused on fashion and innovation. On top of this, they also had a hand in changing the logistics of the company after in 1922, Paul Louis moved the company operations to a larger town, Chaux de Fonds, in the canton de Neuchâtel, where he set up a subsidiary company before moving the company a few times after this, until in 1937, when the entire company moved their headquarters to Geneva. Geneva, at this time, was the capital of haute horlogerie, or high-end watchmaking. So positioning the company here, they made sure that they were known in the heart of the watchmaking industry as a luxury. Plus, this also came with the added benefit at the time that Geneva was a bustling, cosmopolitan city with a strong international presence so that would allow the company access to a wider range of global clientele. The move was incredibly smart and incredibly successful. The company's reputation exploded from this point and they became one of the most respected and profitable watchmakers in the world. 
Still today, the company is headquartered in Geneva and they continue to be a leader in the industry. So clearly this was the smartest move for the company, undoubtedly. Under his son, the company grew to be one of the most significant watchmakers in the world. But unfortunately, it was in 1943 when his son, so Louis Le Chapelle's grandson, Paul André, took over the company, the company would really come into its first truly turbulent period. But it wasn't really their fault, as obviously this was right at the height of the Second World War. I know I've said before that companies in Europe that survived the war had to have some kind of involvement with the Nazis. But actually, Chopard is one of the very few that have no direct connection to the Nazis whatsoever. But that came at a cost. Throughout World War II, most of the brand's European markets had crumbled. They became heavy with debt and had a hard time coming back to profitability. I previously called the company the ready-to-wear of timepieces as well, but throughout this time, timepieces had become more accessible elsewhere and therefore they'd become cheaper to the everyday person, obviously, because the war democratized everything and made wristwatches far more common for both men and women. But while this was happening, Chopard was positioning themselves as a luxury in the market through heavy investment in marketing that actually started all the way back in 1913. That's not to say that they weren't a luxury before either, even their original watches were made of gold and only the mega rich could afford timepieces anyway at this time. But as more people started being able to afford watches and timepieces in general, it became important to position Chopard specifically as a luxury. So over this time, their focus became heightened into a focus on desirable luxury timepieces. But that didn't mean the company was profitable. Though Paul André had managed to keep Chopard afloat in this post-war period long enough to see its 100th anniversary in 1960, the company was not doing well. Despite managing to keep some wealthy, loyal clients in Scandinavia, by this point they had only five members of staff. Poor André had no children who wished to try to help save this failing business, and so Chopard began to realize that selling the family business, despite his own personal wishes, would be the only way to save it. Which is when in 1963, Karl Schäufele III would purchase the company from Paul André Chapard and actually made a great merger. Karl Schäufele III was a German born goldsmith and watchmaker who was already running his own third generation watchmaking company called Karl Schäufele & Company. This company was actually bigger than Chopard at the time and Though we don't have sales figures because they are both privately held companies, the business seemingly just brought up their competition. But it wasn't as simple as that. Karl Schofler and Co. wanted to expand their business by vertically integrating into owning their own factory, something that Chopard had and was looking to sell. To make the sale, an undisclosed amount was paid which the Schofler family financed, but in return agreed to keep the headquarters in Geneva to maintain the current workforce of Chopard. Usually, this kind of deal would result in an absorption of the smaller business and the name would be slowly phased out. But because Schofler and Chopard, the men, hit it off so well on a personal level, this ended up being a merger of the two companies as the Karl Schofler and company moved their headquarters to Geneva to join Chopard. So, Likely this was for the same reasons that Chopard had moved there in the first place, they actually agreed to restore the Chopard name to its former glory. But, as well as all of this, they were actually just generally a really good fit for the brand. The Karl Schofler & Company was already known for their luxury watches, but also in the level of investment in research and development. So, merging the Karl Schofler & Company research and development with the Chopard ability to innovate and having their own manufacturing facilities was a great marriage and saw the company even better as a partnership than they could have dreamed of if they had simply absorbed. By the late 60s, early 70s though, the company was still not doing great. 
The market in general wasn't doing very well after a recent quartz crisis left the Swiss watches rather out of fashion, but little did they know, they were about to hit the mother load. In 1976, inspired by his trips to the Middle East, Schäufler had the idea to include diamonds into their watches, in a setting that allowed them to move around inside their casing. This, what began as a men's watch, was released in the same year and became known as their Happy Diamonds watch. The design featured a dial with floating diamonds in the watch that you can literally see go around the face. It was exceptionally successful for all of its novelty, perhaps even their biggest seller to this day, still regularly being copied by other brands. Obviously, the watch was a smash success, and it would actually pave the way for something that would revive the brand again a little bit later. In 1980, as the company introduced their first steel watches, the next generation in the family would join Chopard, with Carl Frederick Schoeffler IV joining the company at only 22 years old. And a short five years later, his sister, Caroline Schoeffler, joined the company, and it was under her supervision that the company would diversify their product offering once again. You see, a 16-year-old Caroline Schoeffler, inspired by the Happy Diamonds watch that I just mentioned, began sketching something just for fun. Inspired by her childhood, she designed a small pendant of yellow gold clown that had dancing diamonds twirling inside its belly that was set in a way like the Happy Diamonds watch that they could move freely inside the pendant. She hadn't actually intended this for production or even meant it to be made whatsoever, but her father, covertly liking the design, had it made in secret at the workshop to be given her as a Christmas surprise. But it was so successful in the workshop that several had been ordered before she was even managed to give it. So naturally, it was far more popular than they could have imagined and ended up inspiring a whole collection of animals that debuted in 1985 that were also an immediate success. This ultimately became the launch of Chopard's very first jewellery line, also named Happy Diamonds, that was so successful that the siblings ended up becoming co-vice presidents as a result. From its inception, the jewellery line really exploded quickly for the company. And though I couldn't find an exact date of the launch of all the different pieces, it's obviously been an incredibly profitable sector for the company, going on to include several different lines, all with things like rings, earrings, necklaces, bracelets, and other types of jewellery. Naturally, she was named co-president with her brother in 2001. The company continued to grow really well throughout the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and 2010s in both of these categories, and even in this time continue to improve their production, product, promotion, and logistics. For production, in 1996, they opened a huge factory in Fleurière. For product, they released the LUC collection of even higher-end timepieces in 1997, as well as many other products, of course. For promotion, they became the official Cannes Film Festival timepiece in 1998, and for logistics, they would include a focus on sustainability. In 2013, the company began to use recycled materials and fair-mined gold as part of their commitment to sustainability. The company has actually had a long history of environmental activism, even joining the Responsible Jewelry Council in 2010 and getting their audit completed and certified in 2012. The initiative generally was quite unexpected, but it ended up being really impactful in terms of proving that this was possible while maintaining a high luxury image in the sector. Currently, Shepard is well situated in their brand positioning as being a very old, very trustworthy brand for luxury timepieces and jewellery. Their heritage brand with a lot of brand value, which is why any changes to this can be considered quite risky. You don't want to lose that brand equity that's so difficult to create in the first place. Which is why I was surprised to learn that this Tuesday they'll be debuting their very first fashion offering. They aren't the first luxury jeweler to go into the fashion market. Both Cartier and Bulgari have bags, even show part of sponsored fashion shows in the past like this Versace show and this couture collection from Yazia Minochkina, 
and even had a collaboration collection with genius couturier Guo Pei in 2017 for which they designed the garments and jewellery to work together. But I believe this is the first luxury jeweller that will be producing a solo clothing collection. I mean, except Tiffany's with their collaborations, but they haven't exactly been well received. For Chopard, they'll be releasing a couture collection at the Cannes Film Festival, where the brand has been the official timekeeper since 1998. Because of this, they effectively have themselves a captive audience in the Cannes Film Festival, being that they have been sponsoring catwalk shows there for years and provide an award ceremony to stars in the making. This year, they've even added eight new awards, along with the Trophée Chauffeur, a prize for new talent. It's just really the perfect place for them to debut their fashion line, given that the company has this long history with the event, as does Caroline herself, and the fact that their target market will largely be in attendance anyway, it's an incredibly clever place for them to begin the fashion line. And in general, having a couture line goes with the brand's high luxury positioning. If I have my marketing mix four P's diagram ready, that's definitely one tick, perhaps even two or three of the four, even before we've seen a single product. So clearly they are setting themselves up for success. But of course, all of that hinges on the design merit. The collection is to be designed by Caroline Schaeffler herself and is said to consist of around 50 looks that complement her jewellery specifically. Also, something I find commendable is that they have baked this in with an emphasis on championing their craftsmanship, with the company regularly making press statements about their work with the Kalhath Institute in India, which is actually a non-profit embroidery education centre. Their fabrics are going to be sourced from Swiss manufacturer Jacob Schleffler, while jacquards are from Italian supplier Gentili Mosconi, and the beading is from Japan, but is to be applied in the Indian workshops. In general, it's incredibly difficult to find any company willing to go into such detail about their supply chain or their manufacturing logistics in this kind of PR article. So to have a company do this for couture is pretty groundbreaking in many ways for transparency. Personally, I really wanted to make this video before the fashion show debuts because I wanted the history of Chopard to stand for itself. Then we use that history to understand and judge the new couture's design merit truly unbiasedly. I hope to return to the brand sometime in the future to give an updated analysis of their fashion offering when we do have more information, more content to be seen. But for now, I really hope this video provided you with the information that you needed going into the upcoming launch. Please do let me know what you think about the new Couture line in the comments below because I'm really interested to have a conversation with you about it when it does come into the public. Thank you so much for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos like this one. Check out my beauty channel for videos like this one but about beauty brands and my Patreon is linked below.